direct from our newsroom in New York. In color, this is the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite and Eric Zeberide in Washington, Dan Rather in Washington, Marvin Kalb at the State Department, Bruce Morton in Springfield, Illinois, Tony Sargent in Washington, Murray Fromson in Chicago, and David Henderson in Chicago. Good evening. There has been a happy moment in the agonizing hours that those hostages are having in the hijacked plains in Jordan's desert. A young woman, an American, gave birth today to a child with the aid of the Red Cross medical team there. Because of communications problems, we don't know the sex or the name of the baby or its parents. But we're informed that both the mother and her infant are doing quite well. And there has been a hopeful sign so far on the fate of those 260 hostages in the desert. Their captors, the most militant of the Arab guerrillas, have extended until Saturday morning their deadline for exchanging the captives for imprisoned Arab terrorists. This gives Red Cross authorities more critical hours to seek an agreement with the commandos. This most dramatic and frightening series of hijackings has triggered some counter-strategy by uh, President Nixon. We begin our reports with CBS News White House correspondent Dan Rather. The President is preparing to announce plans for armed guards aboard international flights of U.S. planes. Tentative plans call for guards to be recruited from among military police, U.S. marshals, and border patrolmen. The President also is expected to announce wider use of electronic sensing devices to detect weapons. The Nixon administration has been increasingly concerned about mail and telephone calls, implying that the president has not been decisive enough in moving against hijackers, past and future. The White House considers such criticism unfair and that such criticism shows lack of understanding for what the president has in fact been doing. So New Secretary Ronald Ziegler, who rarely reads statements before cameras, made a point of doing so today. The president and many of us in the federal government have been intensely involved during these recent days in efforts to obtain the release of the passengers involved in the hijackings. We have also been involved, together with the president, in considering steps that can be taken to pre prevent airline hijacking in the future. Uh, we expect to be able to announce a comprehensive plan of action very soon. In the meantime, I would like to express on behalf of the president his deep concern for the innocent victims who now are going through a terrible ordeal on the Jordanian desert. I would also like to express on the behalf of the president his sympathy for their apprehensive families. The president joins the countless other concerned people around the world who hope and pray for their early and safe return. Announcement of the new preventive steps against future hijackings, including armed guards aboard planes, may be announced as early as tomorrow. This is Dan Rather. The State Department is asserting in the strongest possible terms that the U.S. is now bargaining for the release of all hostages, regardless of their religion. There was speculation prompting congressional anxiety that the U.S. might have to agree to a deal involving the release only of Gentile hostages. While not ruling out such a possibility, given the unpredictable character of the problem, spokesman Robert McCluskey tried to knock down such speculation. We have said repeatedly here over the last several days uh, that the policy of the United States government is to, su uh, is to support the release of all of the hostages. There is uh, no justification whatever for any interpretation that the United States government stands for anything less than the release of all of the hostages. Other officials here can see there are plans to evacuate Americans from Jordan because of the overall deterioration there, but as of this moment, no firm decisions have been made. So uncertain is the whole situation that Secretary of State Rogers has postponed his visit to the United Nations next week. Instead, he will be here to help handle the hijacking problem and to sit in with President Nixon on a meeting with visiting Israeli Premier Golda Meir, that focusing basically on Egyptian violations along the ceasefire zone. Marvin Kalb, CBS News, the State Department. The Russians today got their first official word about the hijackings, and the stories they read in the Soviet press were, for the most part, critical of the guerrillas' actions. The official TASS news agency quoted an Egyptian newspaper saying the hijacking greatly prejudiced Arabs in the eyes of world public opinion. It's a time of waiting and anguish, of course, for the families of those U.S. hijack hostages. Some couldn't even be certain right away that their relatives were hostages. And this was the case with young Yosef Trachman, who was spending the summer in Israel with his aunt. And the uncertainty made his family not only anguished, but angry. David Henderson reports. 
In North Chicago, the Isidore Trackman family heard only today from the State Department that 10-year-old Joseph Trackman is a hostage aboard the TWA jetliner. The boy's father, a rabbi, charges the government lacks feeling for those being held. I believe very definitely, uh, not only I believe, I think the, their actions have shown that they are only concerned with the political aspects uh, for the simple reason that if you're concerned, if you feel, if you at all sense the anguish, you respond to it. They have not responded to it. What do you think the government should be doing? The very first thing is an expression of recognition of their plight, an expression of compassion, an expression of anguish, an expression of concern. That's the very first thing. And until they manifest their concern and their anguish and their compassion, I can't expect the Arabs to respond uh, with uh, any recognition of these people as people. Ironically, before he left home, young Joseph Trachman told his family he hoped he'd be hijacked so he could visit Jordan. For some of the hostages' families in the United States, this week's ordeal has been a remembered hell. Alexander Herman of Brooklyn has a 17-year-old daughter, Miriam, on one of the planes. My wife was four years in Auschwitz, he said, and I was four years in a concentration camp in Hungary, and I lost four children by Hitler, and now I'm going through the same thing again. So too is Nathan Leeser of New York, whose wife and two children are hostages. In his words, he went through five years in a concentration camp, and we never expected in our lives that our children would be exposed to similar types of mental torture. CBS News has managed to contact relatives or friends of 75 of the TWA and Swiss Air passengers. Of these, 17 adults and 12 children are believed to be in the desert, 16 adults, 12 children in that Amman hotel but the whereabouts of 13 adults and 13 children are unknown. Strangely, as witnessed today's normal birth of a baby, the tension, as far as we can tell, seems less on the tarmac at Dawson's Field. A Dutch television reporter, Ben al Carbot, interviewed one of the hostages yesterday. My name is Tova Lev Khan, and I'm an Israeli citizen. So as an Israeli citizen, what did you feel when you saw this Palestinian uh, uh, resistance took over the plane? Well, at first we got a little scared because we didn't know it was so fast. And then I knew they had their reasons for doing that. And we were just hoping that we would be safe no matter what. You know uh, what Israel has to do to, uh, to relieve uh, their citizens of this plane? Well, uh, some of the people who were taking care of us told us that they had given a list to the Israeli government of the people they want to release. I never had any doubt that they would give anything that uh, was requested to get us out. How is the treatment here by the people of the Palestinian uh, Popular Front? We were treated very kindly and uh, with very, very well in yeah. every respect. But, uh, what do you think about here? You amuse yourself or you're bored? I'm bored. <laughs> I'm bored. You want to go home? Yeah. And what do you think of the people who are guarding you here? They're pretty nice. They're friendly. In London, it's reported that international aircraft insurance underwriters, disturbed by the loss of one 747 and the threatened destruction of three other big planes, are planning on increasing their premiums. In Honolulu, at a meeting of international airline executives, there are indications the higher costs may be passed on to passengers in the form of higher fares. In Washington, it's announced that the federal government underwrote almost $10 million of the $24 million of war risk insurance on that Pan Am 747. Under the law, the government can issue such insurance when it's not available commercially on reasonable terms. It's a real thing. If you're going out in the sun today, you're going to need a real refreshment. Coca-Cola. We're going to drive home a point about anti-leak Xerox antifreeze. It stops most common radiator leaks just like that.
We guarantee it will stop and prevent leaks in your car radiator for a full year or just write DuPont and get your money back. Anti-leak Z-Rex antifreeze is guaranteed not to run out on you. Once again, the government of Jordan and the Palestinian guerrillas agreed on a ceasefire, but only after more shooting was heard today in the capital of Amman. sides were still out in the streets in force. There was still a tense atmosphere of siege, but officers with bullhorns braved sporadic fire to try and calm things down. Avoid propaganda. Avoid propaganda. And here with the Palestinian armed struggle command. Our job is to be calm and to have a unified front in order to be able to attack our main enemy, which is Israel and the imperialism. The revolution is not against your interest, you citizens. It is with your interest. Don't shoot. Don't snipe. In order to go ahead in the revolution and to serve our nation. Be calm. Avoid propaganda. Despite the intensity of the combat, some guerrilla factions, unsurprisingly, had only half a mind on the dispute with Jordan. Others were talking about the consequences of the plane hijackings. Deep political meaning. The Pan American exploded at Cairo Airport as a great political meaning which is that PFLP refuses the political stand of the UAR concerning the peaceful settlement in Palestine. There were well, many Israelis uh, inside the threat of uh, TWA. Yes, there were Israelis. And the conditions are to release our girl commando in London, to give back the body of our martyr in London. Also, the release of a list of our commanders imprisoned in Israel. We would not release the Israeli citizens or those who carry double citizenship, American and Israeli. We will not release them unless all our comrades who were on that list will be released. A guerrilla spokesman also confirmed today that the motive behind the hijackings was the hope that they would destroy the U.S.-sponsored Middle East peace talks. In his words, the Arab commandos are determined to subvert any settlement that does not restore Palestine to the Arabs. Four Czechoslovak couples went on trial in Nuremberg, West Germany today for hijacking a Czech airliner with 16 other people on board and forcing it to fly to Nuremberg last June. The defendants said they were fleeing communism. The latest weekly Vietnam casualty report lists 87 Americans killed and 323 wounded. South Vietnam reported the loss of 469 men, and enemy deaths were put at 1,321. South Vietnamese battle deaths so far this year have been four times greater than U.S. fatalities, reflecting the trend of American disengagement from the war. In Paris, the Vietnam peace talks went through another session with no indication of progress. How about that new Kent menthol? Oh, Kent got it all together. Kent got it all together. Kent has got it all together. It's got everything I want. Kent got it all together. Kent has got it all together. Should have done this years ago. Kent got it all together. A new Kent Menthol 100. It's a new kind of menthol refreshment. Refreshing taste that comes free and easy through Kent's exclusive Micronite filter. Brisk, breezy flavor, famous Kent filter, and good, rich taste. They're all together now in new Kent Menthol 100. All the refreshment of menthol.
Officials in San Quentin Prison disclosed that Sirhan Sirhan, the convicted killer of Robert Kennedy, threw a tantrum in his cell on death row yesterday, but was quickly subdued with tear gas. The official said it was a small amount and added this is a routine procedure in such instances. Officials said Sirhan apparently was annoyed because of delay in getting an interview with the warden. They revealed Sirhan has had full access to newspapers, radio, and television, and must have been aware that Palestinian guerrillas had denied rumors that they wanted him freed as part of their hostage ransom. Chrysler put a second improved contract offer on the table in Detroit today. Details were not made public, but United Auto Workers President Leonard Woodcock said it was still a long, long way from being acceptable. The UAW may strike Chrysler or General Motors when contracts with these two firms and Ford expire next Tuesday. A presidential task force said today that the government attaches too many strings and too much red tape to the Model Cities program. The report called the program a step in the right direction, but a step which has been hobbled by over-regulation and under-support. The task force proposed that procedures be simplified and that the cities be given the money to spend for projects they consider most important. Vice President Agnew set out from Washington today to carry the administration's colors on a week-long campaign 70 tour of six states. His first stop was Illinois in behalf of Republican Senator Ralph Smith. And Tony Sargent reports. The vice president stopped by the White House for a pep talk from President Nixon. Then at Plainside, he told reporters why he's making the trip. It's early to make... Uh any predictions about what's going to happen on this campaign trail, but my purpose is to carry the Nixon message to the people. Principally, we seek to alter the makeup of the Congress sufficiently to give the President uh, more support for vital programs in the coming two years. This is, of course, one of the principal issues uh, is whether the policies of the United States are going to be made by its elected officials or in the streets. I think that's the primary issue. Mr. Agnew's first stop was Springfield, Illinois. CBS News correspondent Bruce Morton is with the vice presidential party. The town is Abe Lincoln's, but Vice President Agnew kicking off his campaign for the congressional election sounded more like Harry Truman, giving hell to the Democratic Congress for doing nothing about President Nixon's programs. There's a new deadlock of democracy today between a progressive president carrying out his mandate for reform and a reactionary Congress in the grip of bitter men who forfeited that mandate. Nowhere has this Congress been more derelict than in its ho-hum, business-as-usual attitude to the President's program to control and reduce the crime and filth in our society. Sixteen months ago, the President proposed the toughest bill in the nation's history to uproot the corrupting influence of organized crime. The bill still sits there, languishing in Congress. Fourteen months ago, the President asked unprecedented power for the Justice Department to crack down on the narcotics merchants who are growing rich, destroying the lives of thousands of our young people. That bill, too, just sits there, languishing in Congress. How many children, my friends, must we pick out of the gutters and alleys of our great cities, dead of overdoses of heroin, before Congress finally decides that maybe it's time to act? Ralph Smith is still the underdog in this race. Vice President Agnew leaves here for Wyoming, his next stop, with the outlines of his campaign already becoming clear. Defend the administration record on the economy, attack the Democratic Congress hard on two other issues, foreign policy and law and order. Bruce Morton, CBS News, Springfield, Illinois. You know, a little while ago, I wouldn't have even tried to do this. I have arthritis, and when my fingers stiffen up and hurt, this sort of thing just isn't any fun. So what's my secret? They are aspirin. Well, it isn't really a secret. Most everyone knows that aspirin is what doctors recommend to relieve minor arthritic pain. Most everything you read about arthritis says that to relieve minor arthritic pain and its stiffness, aspirin is the most effective medication you can buy. And Bayer isn't just part aspirin. Bayer is all aspirin, the world's best aspirin. 
Bayer relieves my pain in its stiffness fast, in a matter of minutes, relieves it for hours. You know, there are millions of people like me with little arthritic pains. I just wish they all knew how much easier life is for me with Bayer Aspirin. The Democrats, too, were on the campaign 70 trail today. And party chairman Lawrence O'Brien was quick to reply to Vice President Agnew. Murray Thompson reports. While Mr. Agnew was in Springfield lambasting Democrats, liberals, and leftists, Democratic Party Chairman Lawrence O'Brien was in Chicago, alongside Mayor Daley, turning the heat on the Republicans. Appearing at a party luncheon in behalf of senatorial candidate Adlai Stevenson III, O'Brien blamed the sluggish economy on what he called Nixononics. Everything that should go up, he said, like jobs, housing, and profits, goes down. Later, O'Brien was asked about the vice president's remarks. Well, Mr. Agnew uh, today uh, seems to be still engaging in the same heavy-handed uh, rhetoric that we've uh, listened to for some time. I would hope that uh, as we now move into the campaign itself, the uh, number of weeks uh, between now and Election Day, that Mr. Agnew would uh, get to a defense of this uh, Republican administration's record. Uh, let me say this, if uh, Mr. Agnew apparently uh, referred to the Congress as a group of cave dwellers, uh, if this uh, Nixon administration continues on its course, I would think uh, we would find ultimately that all Americans would be living in caves. There certainly isn't any housing ongoing in this country these days. A government report blames the federal radar system at Indianapolis Airport for that mid-air collision a year ago between an Allegheny Airlines jet and a private plane in which 82 persons died. The report says both pilots were following their flight plans correctly, but it adds two independent radar systems failed to detect the small plane, so no warning was given to the passenger liner that the other plane was near. The district attorney in Las Vegas says that he won't press assault charges against hotel executive Sanford Waterman, who allegedly pulled a gun on singer Frank Sinatra last Sunday morning in a gambling dispute. The DA, George Franklin, says he was told Waterman had finger marks on his throat to show Sinatra attacked first. Now Franklin wants to talk to Sinatra about the incident the next time the volatile entertainer happens to be in Vegas. Sinatra has indicated that could be quite a while off. The Pentagon isn't flipping its wings over hair pieces. The spokesman says GIs are free to wear wigs that conform to regulations while on duty, any kind of wigs, on their own time. Many servicemen have started wearing long-haired wigs, complaining that girls will no longer have anything to do with those short GI haircuts. The National Highway Safety Bureau has proposed that starting in 1972, all vehicles on highways must have spray protectors over their rear wheels to preserve the visibility of fellow drivers on wet days. The averages were lower again on the New York Stock Exchange. Volume was 11,900,000 shares. The average price per share fell 20 cents on the New York Exchange. On the American Exchange, it stayed the same. In the Caribbean, tropical storm Ella has developed into a hurricane. She's about 500 miles south of New Orleans, moving northwest at 12 miles an hour, still a long way from any land area. The top winds are 75 miles an hour and intensifying. We're going to drive home a point about anti-leak Xerox antifreeze. It stops most common radiator leaks just like that. We guarantee it will stop and prevent leaks in your car radiator for a full year or just write DuPont and get your money back. Anti-leak Xerox antifreeze is guaranteed not to run out on you. Water's great for diets, but not very exciting. This is new Fresca. Only two calories per eight ounces. Only two more than water, but bursting with exciting flavor. Fresca is the body drink, new Fresca. All the diet soft drinks took out cyclovates. Many added sugar, but Fresca didn't add sugar, nor extra calories. Fresca is the body drink, new Fresca. With campaign 70 heating up, Eric Severide in Washington has some observations on the Nixon administration's political tactics. The 1970 political campaigners are now off the mark, feet flying, elbows in gouging position. Most administrations are forced on the defensive in a midterm congressional election, but the Nixon Republicans are taking the offense from the start. 
That has been Mr. Nixon's strategy throughout his own career. His vice president is carrying the load. The Democrats are left with no comparable figure to campaign nationwide, so their national chairman, Lawrence O'Brien, has hit the hustings, declaring for openers that since Mr. Agnew will do nothing but politicking until November, he ought to go off the federal payroll. The cyclical temper of the American voter is such that the presidential party rarely makes congressional gains in a midterm election. The president can't hope for much in the House, but he will fight hard for party gains in the Senate, the seat of his troubles this past year. And he needs a Republican gain of seven seats to give his party control. What he wants are conservative Republicans. He is less allergic to them than to liberal Republicans. A gain of three or four would help him on various critical and persistent issues like military spending, nuclear strategy, and the pace of Vietnam withdrawal. He is well aware that a great army very probably cannot be extricated from Asia without some painful surprises. He is preparing for this with the Agnew speeches, laying the blame in advance for any military humiliations on doves in the Senate and elsewhere. He fears the right wing in this country more than the left. But even should the Republicans take over Senate control, it would not mean Republican roses all the way. As Congressional Quarterly points out, the shift of committee chairman would pretty much mean liberals replacing liberals and conservatives replacing conservatives. Key battles have been fought this year in the Armed Services Committee and in Foreign Relations. Replacing John Stennis with Margaret Chase Smith would scarcely bring joy to Mr. Laird's Pentagon, and George Aiken as a replacement for Fulbright would get only a medium hello from the White House. Aiken not only wants out of Vietnam, but said that we should have declared victory and said goodbye to that country a long time ago. At the moment, most guessing around here is that whatever senatorial gains the Republicans make, they will fall short of numerical control. At the New York City Aquarium, the people in charge of the female octopus want to learn more about the birds and the bees. In June, the octopus laid thousands of eggs, and now hundreds of them are hatching. Officials are delighted and astounded, for the mother has been in captivity, completely isolated from any male octopus for longer than the normal three-month gestation period. The officials think the female may have been inseminated before capture and was able to delay fertilization, but they didn't know octopi could do that. At any rate, in the words of the aquarium director, in the future, we're going to watch this octopus very carefully. And that's the way it is, Thursday, September 10th, 1970. This is Walter Cronkite, CBS News. Good night. Meet the Pinto, just born. Pinto, the new little carefree car from Ford. Priced like a small economy import, but you'd never know to look at it. It's averaged over 25 miles per gallon in simulated city and suburban driving, but it's frisky with a wider stance than any little import, so you won't be pushed around by the wind. With high-backed bucket seats in front and comfortable room all around. And Pinto Strong, built to run and run and run with little servicing, little noise, little expense. Pinto, a little carefree car to put a little kick in your life. A little better idea from Ford, coming September 11th. Direct from our newsroom in New York, in color, this has been the CBS Evening News with Walter Cronkite. 60 Minutes premieres the new season with a look at Gershwin's Porky and Best performed Catfish Row. And a futuristic view of cable television, Tuesday night at 10, 9 central time. Glenn Ford and other top stars in tribute to America. A color special tonight at 8 Eastern Time on CBS.